Welcome to Revelation Reimagined. This is a new series that gets to delve into what Revelation is all about. We're going to discuss how it relates to the end times, the end of the world, what it's about, how does it speak to our lives today. And we're going to do that as a group of four Adventist pastors, Seventh-day Adventist pastors, who love to read, study, and share from the book of Revelation. This is an amazing book. It's got more in it than what we're going to be able to cover in our 12 sessions together. But what we want to do is to bring to you the, the encouragement and the inspiration to study this for yourselves, to be intrigued by what it contains, and to discover that this book is not some hidden, mysterious book that's inaccessible, but this is a book that is given to us to read and understand. On the panel with me, I have Roman Halupka, Peter Hughes, and Michael Mahanu, and my name is Darren Croft, and we will be with you through this series. There will be um, another pastor joining us down the track a little, and we'll introduce you to him when he's able to be with us. So let's get into the book of Revelation. That's what we're here for, and that's what we hope you're here for. If you've got a chance before we start um, getting into the book, grab your Bible, press pause, read Revelation chapter 1, and then press play and rejoin our discussion. So... Revelation. It's a book that some think is scary and mysterious, so why come and study a book that maybe some would say, just leave it alone. It's better to be left alone. And many people started in such attitudes. Better to leave it, not to touch it. But this is a very important book because this book just helps us uh, to understand the time we are living in, and to understand what we can expect. But we have to realize that, yeah, this book is difficult. There are a lot of symbols, there are a lot of strange things that sometimes we don't know what to do with it. But the Bible always has the answer. Mm. Mm. Yes. What you're saying, Roman, is if you use your Bible as the source of explaining these symbols, exactly. if you go in and search out the meaning, you will get the answer. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the the f the very first uh, verses of the book of Revelation actually they, they are an invitation, and it starts with the Father, the Son, working together and unveiling uh, the, the events that were going to come in the history of Christianity. So the book opens with an invitation, okay. and we know that everything everything that comes from God is good, is perfect. Mm -hmm. We need those things that God has given us. So why not starting to, to read the book and trying to understand what are those blessings that actually we need in our lives? So, so can I just ask, just quickly, what got you into the study of Revelation? I un understood that it was a prophetic book. Mm. And it was a prophetic book that spanned the time from the cross until the second coming of Christ. They were, up to the time of Christ, God had spoken through prophets. John was the last of the prophets to actually, who knew God and had been with, with when I say knew, knew God, knew Jesus, mm. and that, and God used him to give warning for the time when there won't normally be prophets speaking from God, because He's, he's going to speak through John, and that will be the final major prophetic message. Mm. Mm. Michael? You know, we, we read the, the Gospels, and the Gospels uh, are telling us what Jesus did when he lived on, on this earth. But what happened after he ascended to heaven? Mm. Is he still engaged with us? He still, still remember us? Is he still interested in our lives? Uh, and not much is given after that, all right? So the book of Hebrews gives us a little bit of understanding that Jesus is involved in the intercessory process, mm. but not, not much, that's it. Without the book of Revelation, actually, we would not understand the deep involvement that Jesus 
has with humanity, with us, since his ascension. So we'll, as we go gradually through the book of Revelation, we'll see his involvement, that he's present there for us all the time. And I think um, th this is very important for me mm. to understand that Jesus is still there for me. The personal and, and present God. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Roman, what got you into Revelation? Well, mainly that, you know, I had to help people as I'm working with, to understand. And, you know, it, it pushed me, myself, to, to go, uh, you know, into the book. And I try to, to find out, you know, not only to understand the times, but, you know, I love always to looking for Jesus in everything what I read. And, uh, and my, first in the Bible, but even all the books, articles I can find about Jesus, I love reading it. So suddenly, as I realized more than before, that this is the book that's a revelation of Jesus Christ. So I said, oh, so that's, that's what, what pushed me into this. And, 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 you know, well, it happened a long time ago, but especially during the last few years, you know, it just drew me more to, to, to the book. And, and I found this, and the different roles of Jesus. Uh, well, we, we know Jesus from, from the Gospels, but here we have a completely different picture of Jesus, what is so important. And, and, you know, if I tried many times to do it, to show Jesus as God, so I, I do it much more uh, easier. And, and, and I think that, that it helps so much to, to show him, to find him as, as God in the book of Revelation. So that's, that's, that's something what's helped me a lot. And, but, you know, it was, yeah, it was, in fact, that even so many years I'm working as a pastor, uh, that's wonderful that, you know, even, uh, you know, such a, such a long period helps you to grow and to know some more. Yeah. And I think, I think what I've enjoyed in, in the book, so when I started out, I came to the book of Revelation, a bit like you, Peter, you know, here's a prophetic book. Mm. What's it, what does it tell us about what's coming? So that's where I started with it, but in the process, you know, have ended up in a place that I, I think, you know, I'm still learning, but I think is much more positive than just, oh, you know, I wonder what 666 means. You know, it's, it's bigger than that. And um, I think just for those that are, that are watching from home, you know, we spent, as, as pastors, we spent quite a number of, sessions on Zoom through Melbourne's long lockdowns where we'd get together often on a Friday morning and study the book together, mm. which is what has led us to, to this. Now, as we come to the book, as Peter said, we, we expect this to you know, give us the sweep of history. There's some that want to push it into the past or into the future. We're not doing that. We're taking the book on face value that it's giving us this big sweep of history. We, we also expect there's symbolism in the book. Yeah. So we'll try and unpack those symbols. Um, what else will help people understand as we start to read? I think we, it's very important to understand the connection, the intimate connection between, between this book and the whole book, mm. the whole Bible. And we'll see again and again the, the imagery that comes from the Old Testament again and again, all the time. So there, there is an intimate connection uh, between, we say, it's, it, it's a principle that we'll, we'll understand the book of Revelation by going back into the Old Testament and understanding the concepts that then they are brought into the book of Revelation, mm -hmm. like... For example, the book of Revelation talks about Babylon. We know that Babylon is not there today, all right? So definitely it doesn't talk about a physical, geographical location, but it takes that, that illustration uh, um, that is charged of, with emotion and, 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 and spirituality. What happened there from a spiritual point of view, the battle that took place there, it brought into the book of Revelation to give meaning to the battle that we have today, to the end of time. 
Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, but but you know, uh, as as the book is so much connected and quoting all the time Old Testament, so at the same time, uh, this book is specific. It's completely different, mm. and and you know that's probably pushed some people into looking and cutting from nowadays only. Oh, that's only about the past. Mm. Only about the past, or some other uh, we call them preterist. You know, all about the future, and and you know, and and they they everything. Well, that's not now. That's not now. That's safer. But but you know, we have to put it together, mm. and in this way, we we look at the book, and that's what we'll try to do. Mm. You know, to based on on the past and realizing the future, trying to adapt it for our days, mm. what it means for us now, letting mm. it speak for itself. But I, I think. There, there is merit in every school of interpretation, all right? So we spoke mm -hmm. about the preterist that is looking into history. It's good to look into history to understand the yeah. context. Uh, futurist, futuristic uh, uh, school looks into the future, what is going to happen in the future, uh, and the, the, the understanding of spiritualizing uh, the meaning of the book of Revelation. Again, there, there is something for every one of us to mm. understand from yeah. a spiritual point of view, the, the battle, you know, between good and evil that we find in every one of us. But I think it's very important for us to, to say right from the beginning that we discovered that the historicist school of interpretation is actually the most accurate and um, it, it's faithful to the understanding of the book of Revelation. This is what we are going to follow in explaining the book. When you say historicist, what do you mean? It's what, what, what Darren mentioned before. Uh, the fact that it's, it's, a, it's a sweep uh, of, of history from, from the disciples, from the time when the disciples lived on earth, all the way to uh, the second to yeah the yeah. fulfillment of yeah. the history so you 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 know of event an event because people at that time wrote it down and recorded this is what happened mm. so if we take those events that were recorded and taken and people understood and wrote about and look back at them they will support what the bible is saying yes absolutely absolutely yeah, and I guess in that sense, you see, you know, the book is full of not only symbolic um, things like Babylon, but also numbers that are as much about qualities as quantities. But this sense that, you know, Matthew, Mark and Luke all have an apocalyptic chapter. Yeah. John doesn't. This is John's apocalyptic book, not just apocalyptic chapter. Right. It connects back to Daniel and we'll see that as we go. But let's let's come to the book itself because... That's what we're here to do, to get into the book and let it speak for itself. And we'll, we'll read, we'll put some passages up on the screen, others you'll just be able to follow along with a Bible there. So in Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, it opens with these words. The revelation from Jesus Christ, or the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. They're already seeing time frame. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. So just give, what's the context? Where is John? What's going on in these opening verses here? John is on the island of Patmos. He was sentenced there. He's working there. And well, what a release from this hard so, work. So, so let's just be clear on this. You know, you see pictures of the Isle of Patmos today, and it's this beautiful place surrounded oh, by yeah. blue sea and, you know, all of that. But there was a quarry there, and, you know, he was just cutting the stones, the rocks. That, that there was heavy work. And suddenly, what a blessing, you know, what he got from Jesus. So he's not at a holiday resort. Yeah, mm. yeah. So, so the blessing was that, that, you know, he has the vision. For John, we know him as a beloved 
disciple of Jesus. We know him as a, as a person who, who was so close to Jesus. And, and, you know, he suffered already a lot because of his beliefs. Mm. And now he has the vision of Jesus Christ. So, so th that was a blessing. So maybe that's the reason we call this book. Uh, we, we can call this book the book of blessings because you, you just read, you know, what is the blessing, you know, this yeah. beautiful blessing. So, so it's it's as as you read, Darren. He um, he made it known by sending his angel. So it was a vision given to John by a heavenly mm -hmm. messenger, and it was that the word of God, that it is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Mm. He is linking the concept of God and Jesus together. Mm. It is the word of God. And John, when he wrote his gospel, actually said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was, was God. God. Mm. So this is the testimony of Christ mm. as God. So, so we're being very upfront at this is from Jesus and about Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Michael? Yeah. Uh, another context that we can see in these three verses is the local church, local congregation context. We know that over, over centuries um, there, there were people uh, that said, no, no, don't touch the book of Revelation because it's a closed book, it's a dangerous book, and if you read it, you might get some misunderstandings and you, you get lost, you, you lose your soul or whatever. Uh, but right from the beginning, the book is inviting not only the clergy, not only the, the learned and theologians, but is inviting every single person in the church to come and read the book. So it's an open book that can be understood. And uh, verse 3, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. So this is the context of the early church, where not many people were literate in, in the church. They, they couldn't read. So and, and anything written was handwritten. Was handwritten, yes. So you have, you have a person that can read. So he'll be uh, in the middle of the congregation, open the book of Revelation and starting to read. And there is a blessing for the reader. And then he says, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart. So now this is plural. Mm. So all the congregation that will listening uh, to, to the reading, and they, they had a blessing as well. So they would hear it, they take to heart, that means not only hearing and forget about it, but take it to heart, so understand. Uh, and so probably the, someone would read uh, a portion of the book, and then they will all open for discussion. There's like a Bible study group. Mm. Um, so this is the setting, and they will, they will be blessed in that setting, in reading and understanding the book. Yes, so as, as you go on there, it is addressed to, to seven churches. We won't worry about that too much because we'll pick that up in our next session. But yes, we, we almost have this picture of whoever the messenger was bringing the scroll into the church, reading it out loud, people hearing it. Then he goes on to the next church and the next church and repeats the process. And the promise is for both the reader and the hearer, blessing. Yes. So as we, we go into the study of the book of Revelation, we anticipate that we're going to get a blessing out of this and those who are part of this are going to get a blessing as well. God wants you to understand. He wants everyone to understand. Yeah. Yes. It's yeah. Like Michael said, it's not closed. It's open for understanding. Yeah. yeah. So as we as we go on through this, you know, we we will come next time to the seven churches and we'll look at them. While it's mentioned here, what we what we really want to get to is a picture that it introduces shortly. Now, on the way to introducing that picture, there's another verse we want to read. And this shows the expectation that's embedded in Revelation that Jesus is coming back. So Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 says, Look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. All peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen.
Why has it dropped this in here at this point? Well, he want, the, the message is saying, look, he is coming. Mm -hmm. All right. So you, you have an expectation that the, the one being spoken about is coming back. The next verse tells you who the he is. All right. Verse 8 says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Yes. Mm. Mm. Those two words, I am, very interesting, because I've heard them before. I've read them before <laughs> in, in the Bible. Yeah. So we, we said to you that you'll find the answers in the Bible. So if we go back to where I first heard those words, I am, I'm going back to the burning bush. And I'm going back to Exodus. I'm going back to Exodus. And if, if, the, if the statement, I am, is given by the same one that gave it at the burning bush, mm. it's been given by God. But in Revelation, he isn't the God divine that Moses met. It is Jesus Christ. Mm. The two are linked. Well, it's interesting too, if you connect the I am statements in the Gospel of John, same author, prior to this, he, he embeds in, in his Gospel the seven I am's where Jesus says, you know, I'm the light of the world, I'm the bread of life and all the other I am's. The Pharisees challenged him, didn't they? They weren't happy about that, were they? No, they weren't happy. So they said, what authority have you got? Yeah. So what did Jesus say? He said, before Abraham was, I am. Yeah. Mm. Jesus is linking himself to the burning bush and then again to Revelation. Big claim. Big claim. Michael? So I'm looking to that chapter, actually, John chapter 8, where Jesus said so many times, I am. Mm. So I am, I am the light of the world. I am the one I claim to be. Um, and again, I am the white, the one I claim to be. And then previously in chapter six, he identifies himself with the bread of life. Yes. And then he finishes I with, uh, yeah. Um, I am the way. Peter just said before Abraham uh, was born, I am. And from this moment on, they picked stones. They wanted to kill him. Yes. Because they knew exactly what he was claiming. And it's interesting, you now we find, again, the same thing. Jesus claimed to be the great I Am of the Old Testament, the deliverer, the, the one that delivered people of Israel from, from, uh, from uh, uh, slavery, yeah. that played such an important role in the life of the mm. Israelites. Mm. When, he, when he said in chapter 8, I Am, he goes on in that same statement to say the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And it says, John then wrote, says the Lord. Yes. And, and, it, and goes on, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Yes. So he's making the claim mm. that he was the God of the Old Testament that met Moses. He then became the Messiah mm. that was challenged by the Pharisees. And after he died on the cross, he was reinstated to heaven. So he is the restored I am. So his ascension to heaven is obviously very significant. And we, we you know, we pick a little bit of that from Acts, um, both chapter one and chapter two, where, you know, as he ascends to heaven and there is almost, well, in chapter two of Acts, there is this coronation scene mm. where Jesus is you know anointed with the oil which is what would happen with an old testament king and that oil flows you know figuratively speaking from heaven down to earth on the day of pentecost where the holy spirit comes mm -hmm. and and here in revelation there's that connection to it you know he's the eternal present yeah. well that coronation scene is repeated in revelations chapters four and five yeah and that we'll get to that later on but yeah. it's it, it's telling us that the God of the Old Testament, God of the New Testament, the God of our time, was Jesus Christ, is Jesus Christ, and is coming back. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I wanted to add here. I'm sorry, Michael. No. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, you know, because we, we just introduced Jesus, how he's introducing mm. himself. But, you know, but he's adding this, look, he's coming, 
here he says that the John says, but but he, what you what you said in the eighth uh, chapter that as Jesus introduces he introduces himself, uh, uh, he says that who is come who is going to come. Yes. So he's. He, the second coming of Jesus, again the coming here, mm. is so important that it starts from the first chapter and it will appear in the whole book many times. Yeah, and, and the reality is we, you know, we, we don't fully comprehend yeah. how Christ can come on the clouds, but everything that has been laid out has happened as he said it would, and the point is he's promised he's coming again yeah. soon. Yeah. yeah, whatever soon yeah. will look like. So, just just for a second, uh, I want to go back to uh, verse seven. Yeah, um, because I think it's it's very important. All right, uh, Luke, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierce him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. I feel this is like a stamp where right from the beginning, Jesus is putting his stamp on the book mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and says, this is my book. Uh, I have written this book. This is a, a sign of authority. And I think it's not an accident that right from the beginning of the book, in the introductory part of the book, Jesus pu puts this, this sign that it belongs to him and we have to trust that we're in the, in the author of the book. All right, so as we read the book, we trust the author, and, and uh, mm -hmm. Roman mentioned before, uh, you know, Jesus is actually everywhere present in this book, and this, it's important for us to identify him. But this verse in itself, uh, um, so we, we, we can see Matthew 24, it's present day, he's coming with the clouds, mm -hmm. it's a repetition of, of the way Jesus' return is presenting in Matthew 24. Every eye will see him, Yep, it's not a secret event. It's not a secret, it's universal, and again, it's a repetition of, of, um, of Acts chapter 1, you know, verse 11, where the angels came and said the same way, the same manner you saw him coming, he will come down. Yeah. So it's not secretive, nothing secret about the second coming. In uh, Matthew also, in ch chapter 24, he says, if you're told he's here or you're told he's yeah. there, yes. don't go and see him. Yes, yeah. So because denying that secretive aspect yeah. of his coming. Uh, so we, we see right in the stamp and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So it has a universal <laughs> application. So is it good news or bad news? Why are they mourning? Or is, is there more to come? I think there's more to come, all right. Mm. <laughs> I think there's a lot more to come. There's mm. a lot more to come. And I guess that's, it, it's kind of a bit of a, an obvious question so but but the point is as we go through revelation we are going to see different reactions to the second coming of jesus yeah. some will mourn everyone will see him but not all mourn there's another yeah. bunch that are very very happy to see him come. Yeah. And, and actually that mourning is referred to what it says even those who pierce him yeah so not only the roman soldier that pierced him but there are so many others that pierce him. Have, have rejected right. him. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That rejected him. So, so I think that's where the expression comes. But when we look at the verses before, it talks about the other people, the other class of people that have accepted him. Yes. And yes. yes. All right. Let's let's go to the description that it gives us, and this is from verse twelve through to eighteen, and it's such an important description that we are going to take the time to put it on the screen and read it. So let's pick it up at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 12. And it says there, I turned, this is John writing, John speaking, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, 
Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Who's being pictured here? It can only be one who has been divine and is a man, because when John turned to see the voice that spoke to him, I saw one like the Son of Man. Mm. He didn't say he was the Son of Man. He said he is like the Son of Man. So there's something different. There was something different, and the description that you read sort of highlighted that. His face shone like the sun, yeah. and he was dressed in the garb of a high priest. Yeah. And that so... And he, and he was alive, and yet he'd been dead. That's yes. right. Yes. yes. So again, it can only be Christ. Okay, so that's that's the simple answer. It's Jesus. Yes. Let's yeah. put that on the table. That's really clear. Even difference. Even difference. A little bit. But where is Jesus now? He he has the lamp state. We here have the seven lamp states, and and we uh, and we also besides the lamp states we have the uh, seven stars, and so it shows that Jesus wants to be seen here in the very beginning of the book as somebody who is very much interested the, uh, uh, with the church, his church, with his followers. Because you started to read from the 12th verse. Yes. But in the 11th verse, the churches are mentioned by name. All right. And that's, you know, that's the church in Ephesus, the church of Smyrna, the church of Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, the Philadelphia, and, and Laodicea. So, so we know now who is, who is addressed there about how the church is called here. And the whole attention is centered not in the church in Jerusalem, what is interesting, not the church in Antioch in Syria, Syria but, but it's attended to, to Asia Minor, to, to nowadays Turkey, and, and in this area where those seven churches are rather close to each other. Mm. What well, walking distance? Yeah. Those churches are not based mainly on the Jewish people, yeah. but on the, well, how we call it, Gentiles. Yeah. Heathen people, well, wait a moment. So they accepted the truth. And, and the message is addressed to them. Well, not yet the message, but, 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 you know, Jesus is interested in them so much as he is just among those candlesticks. Yeah, I was going to say, that's the thing. Again, it's, 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 he's interested because he's present among them, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Uh, what about some of the other symbols that you see in, in this description in Revelation? He, he, he... Intru he reaffirms the I am, doesn't he? You know I'm yes, interested that comes up in again. the I am. <laughs> yep. I am the first and the last. Yep. I am the living one. Again, he's highlighting this, this point. Mm. What does it mean about the keys of death and Hades? What would you, what would you imagine? Well, I, I guess sometimes we think of Hades, well, some people would think of Hades as hell or something like that but the the literal greek meaning of the word hades is just the grave yeah. and i guess because jesus is the one that has come through the grave and come out the other side even when we face death we can have the assurance that jesus he's got the keys yes yeah. Yeah. Uh, another important element here when when we read the description of jesus his attire uh, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest um, and then surrounded by seven lampstands. Um, for a Jewish mind, reading this passage automatically will suggest that he was in the temple. Yeah, just, just elaborate on that a little bit because the the... Those familiar with the Old Testament would have immediately grasped that. We may be not so much. What, what's the significance of the temple here? Yeah, so, so it's interesting that uh, at the time when John receives uh, the vision of the book of Revelation, that is probably in year 95, at the end of the century. So he's an old century, man. Old he's man an old point. man. And yep. um, uh, the temple in Jerusalem was gone, mm. right? We know it was destroyed in year 70. 
So John doesn't see Jesus in the temple in Jerusalem. He's seeing Jesus in a different temple. And that imagery comes back again and again through the book of Revelation that Jesus is in a temple, actually the heavenly temple, where now, according to Apostle Paul in, in reading Hebrews chapter 4, he's a mediator, mediator, he's a high priest interceding for us. Mm. So that's where we see him, that's where he is, that's where the book of Revelation is presenting him. And that is important because the temple is connected to our salvation. What happens in the temple uh, is is connected to the 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 the, the plan of salvation uh, that is unfolding, you know, in our lives, in lives of humanity. So, so just just let's tease this out a little bit. So, in the Old Testament, when you when you sinned, when you'd done wrong, you would go to the temple, you would confess your sins over a lamb. The lamb would would die, um, and that would. The blood would take away the blood would take away your sins, and you would confess that you know over the lamb in front of the priest. Yes. Now we're saying that. Well, one more step as we you go to what you're saying. Yeah. Those sins were then taken into the sanctuary. Okay. Yes. Yes. And that's so that the the sin had been recorded, and it your confession, your repentance of that sin yeah. had been. So, taken into the so there's this whole slightly elaborate process by which sin is, is dealt with, whereas what we're now saying in um, the New Testament era is that Christ is our high priest. Yeah. And this is a picture of Christ as our high priest. It draws on imagery from Daniel and all over the place. Um, so if Christ is our high priest, what's changed? Well, he's also our sacrifice. All right, yes. He was the lamb that died on the cross. Yeah. So when his blood was shed, he paid the price for sin. Yeah. But now he's the high priest that brings atonement for sin. And Yes. So New Testament, Jesus dies, curtain in the temple tears from top to bottom, signifying that the earthly temple and sacrificial system has accomplished its purpose. Yes. It's pointed to Christ. So if Christ is now in heaven, which is what you're saying, there's new things happening. Yes. He's... Yes. Can I just bring in the double-edged sword? Yes. The double-edged sword is the weapon that God asks you to have. He, he says in... Uh, um, Ephesians, take on the armour of God yeah. and in your hand you have the two-edged sword. But the two-edged sword is the word of God, the truth of God. So you're not actually holding a weapon that you're going out to run through people. Yes. You, you're holding the weapon of the truth and the love of Christ, which is the description, the understanding of describing who God is yeah. and what he represents. Yeah. So as we, we draw towards um, closing this chapter off, you know, we, we see this magnificent picture of, of Jesus and this actually now threads through the next two chapters as well. So this, this forms, if you like, a, a backdrop to the seven churches. We've been introduced mm. to the seven churches. We've been introduced to the Christ of the seven churches. And with each of the seven churches, there is a different element of this description that is given to those churches as being particularly meaningful to them. And, and yes, that double-edged sword does come up again as we go into chapters two and three. So as the, the chapter comes to an end, it says, write the things, this is verse 19, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things that which will take place after this. So again, it's showing that sweep of history. Yeah. Can you take particular notice of the things which are, mm -hmm. that is the message of the seven churches, but then he says, and the things which will happen after this. Yeah. 
So you've got two time frames. You've got the immediate time frame yep. of the vision, and then you've got the time frame that was going to be explained that happens after. Mm. So it's operating on multiple levels it's here. Hop- mm. it, yes. Yep. Yep. Um, and then it says, you know, this, the mystery of the seven mm. stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars... So this is how we we start to, you know, this is an easy one to pick up on in terms of understanding the symbolism. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches or messengers and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see this sort of thing work all the way through Revelation, aren't we? Um, And it's the number seven here a few times repeated. Uh, and seven yes. is a complete uh, number, so so it's it's comforting because it means that does it mean there is something for us nowadays? You know, because the seven will will represent the whole church mm-hmm. through all the ages, not only in the first that we mentioned that there are these Gentile ch- churches, you know, in Asia Minor. No, that's that's something more. So that's 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 something great. That's yeah. a hope. Yeah. That's something for us. All right, so we need to we need to wrap up this first session. If you're to look back on this first chapter of Revelation, what would you say is your key out of this chapter? What's what's the one thing that you would say? This is what we need to know. For me, that's what I just mentioned. You know, is that Jesus is still interested in his followers in his church, and he's present all the time. So he, he's, he's the main topic, he's, he's the most important person we have to find in the whole book all the time. And that's, that's what is in, the church, in his church and generally in the whole history of humanity. He's present and he's realizing his plans, but in, in, in a way he's depending, depending on our decision. And that's something what counts. Yeah, good. Peter? Um, for me, the most important aspect of this first chapter is the I am. Mm. Because what it does is it links Christ, the sacrifice, with the God of the Old Testament. Mm. And I'm, I'm often drawn to the statement that John made when he, when he wrote his gospel after seeing the book of Revelation, after seeing the I am and the visions with the I am, that he said, um, no one has seen the Father. And if he says no one has seen the Father, we will introduce you to the concept through this series of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit as three separate persons. So that if we, if John is writing about three separate persons and no one has seen the Father, who is then the God of the Old Testament that was seen by mm-hmm. mankind, Adam and Eve and all of the prophets and those? Who did they see? Mm-hmm. They had to see Christ. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And we're not saying three separate gods. You know, no. The three are one. The three are in harmony and, and act together, yes. Yeah. But, but there is that sense of Jesus is maybe more significant than some people have thought. Well, he's the visible face of God, isn't he? Yeah. So that if you want to come close to God, you can come close to God through Christ. Yeah. Good. Thanks, Peter. Michael? As, as we go through the book of Revelation in our study, we'll, we'll come to difficult passages mm. where we, we read about persecution, hardship, um, even death. Um, but I think right from the beginning, Jesus gives us the assurance <coughs> that, that he loves us and he's with us. And I'm looking at uh, the last part of um, verse 5, where he says, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom of priests, right from the beginning he gives us the assurance, <coughs> you're going to go through hard times. And we go back to when the revelation was given uh, at the end of the first century. And that was just just the beginning of the persecution uh, because of the pagan Roman Empire. We know the Christian church went through a horrific uh, persecution time. 
So Jesus gives us the assurance, you know, I love you, I freed you of your sins, and you'll be with me in paradise. So he gives us right from the beginning uh, that, that, that promise that is so solid that whatever we are going to go through, we have the confidence that he is with us. Mm. Look, and I guess the, the final thought I, I would add in that, you know, in Revelation, we're, we're on a treasure hunt. Mm. And there's a treasure of prophecy, but there's a treasure of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to what we're going to discover as we go through this. And we hope you'll continue the journey with us. And as we go into our next session, you know, grab a Bible, have a read of Revelation chapter 2 and 3 before we get there because that'll, that'll be helpful in preparing. But now we want to invite you to join with us as we close in a short prayer and then we'll tell you just a little bit more about next time. Thank you. Dear Jesus, we thank you for this book that you have given us. We thank you that Revelation is a book to be understood, to be read and that we can gain a blessing from. Thanks, too, that you start with this amazing and beautiful picture of Jesus that can sustain us through even the darkest times. So be with us on this journey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So as I said, next time, Revelation chapter 2 and 3, and we look at these seven messages to seven different churches, and we see how that applies not only in history, not only to us each individually now, but also they describe this broad sweep of history. So we look forward to being with you next time. God bless.